I'm Jack Schmidt, Apollo 17 astronaut and geologist. Flew on the Apollo 17 mission in December of 1972. Crew of Apollo 17 was an aggregate of two backup crews, Apollo 14 and 15. Uh, I replaced Joe Engel on that crew, and uh, Gene Cernan would be the commander, and Ron Evans uh, was going to continue as the command module pilot. Gene Cernan got out of the spacecraft first, and uh, I followed him very, fairly quickly afterwards. We were in a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. The mountains on either side were 2,100 meters, or about 7,000 feet high. The sun was as brilliant as any sun that you can imagine even more uh, impressive uh, was the uh, earth, which was hanging over uh, one of the mountains and stayed at hanging over that mountain, the South Massif. And that was really a magnificent sight for me, and that's what I remember as being sort of my first real impressions of the Valley of Tars Littrow. After the uh, deployment of the uh, Apollo Lunar Surface Science uh, Package, we had enough time for an abbreviated exploration traverse that originally was supposed to go out to a crater uh, called Powell. Uh, however, we had to cut that short, and we stopped that traverse at uh, a crater known as Steno. Uh, Steno was a place uh, to gain samples of the upper part of the basalt lava flows that had uh, partially filled this deep uh, mountain valley called Tars Littrow. We also, during that excursion, realized that we couldn't continue uh, to drive without the right fender. Now, what happened to the right fender? Well, it was broken off when Gene Cernan walked by it with a hammer in his pocket and uh, hooked that hammer uh, around the fender and broke it off. That uh, created a sort of rain of dust down on us and our equipment. Now, when we left the uh, lunar module on the second excursion, we uh, carried with us down the ladder a, a new fender that was made up of the uh, photo maps that we had in the cabin, taped together with gray duct tape, as you might expect. We headed out uh, as fast as we could to get as far away as we could within the walk-back envelope for any kind of uh, rover failure that uh, would require us to uh, walk or run back to the lunar module. Uh, that took us about seven kilometers from the lunar module to a point within what is actually a moat that surrounds the base of the South Massif. The large crater known as Nansen is not really an impact crater, but a particularly uh, prominent part of that moat. Station two at the eastern end of Nansen was uh, a, selected by me as a place where there were numerous boulders that had rolled down the side of the South Massif. I was uh, headed down uh, the slope back to the lunar rover, and uh, I noticed out of the corner of my eye a, a light greenish uh, inclusion or fragment in another boulder and uh, skidded to a stop, went uh, back and sampled that inclusion, which turned out to be dated uh, back here on Earth uh, radioisotopically uh, as uh, having uh, formed uh, 4.6 billion years ago. Well, that's a little bit older than the moon, and so the error in that date uh, has to be something uh, a bit larger than normal. But nevertheless, it was formed soon after the moon itself formed. So that was one of the more important samples that we found on the entire mission. Station 3 on the edge of the crater Lara, uh, recognizing the uh, writing talents uh, that uh, produced Dr. Zhivago, actually became known as Ballet Crater because I uh, ended up spending a lot of time wallowing around in the lunar dust trying to recover samples I had dropped. What looked like an impact crater had penetrated the light mantle and thrown up a relatively dark material onto its surface. This was the crater Shorty, Station 4. But within the resolution we had, it was not absolutely certain in our minds before the mission that Shorty was an impact crater. It might have been one of those volcanic craters we were looking for that would have been the source of these uh, 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 volcanic glasses, the pyroclastic glasses that had partly led us to select Tars Littrow as a landing site. 
Indeed, it was an impact crater. Uh, and as I walked up to it, uh, uh, I uh, noticed that the uh, regolith, the debris layer at its rim, had an orange cast to it. And so I began to dig into the uh, into that uh, rim and uncovered uh, these orange uh, glasses, the so-called orange soil, uh, and uh, that has become so prominent and important in our considerations of the origin of the moon. As we approached the base of the North Massif, we got even a better view than we had had from the lunar module of the boulder tracks that had uh, uh, been left by large boulders as they rolled down uh, the side of the North Massif. Uh, the one boulder we did visit at Station 6 uh, was big enough to give us a contact between an uh, older blue-gray uh, rock uh, made up of fragments of other rock, or what we call a breccia, that had been intruded by a tan-gray uh, breccia that had partially melted, uh, by, been partially melted by the impact that formed the Serenitatis uh, Basin. That uh, uh, has given us a date for the uh, Serenitatis Basin forming event of about uh, 3.87 billion years. On the way back to the uh, lunar module, uh, after the work at Station 6 and, uh, and two other stations along that mountain front, the plan was, and indeed we did go to uh, a station known as Van Serg. The Van Serg name came from a uh, a pseudonym that a professor of mine at Harvard, uh, Hugh McKinstry, uh, used as he published uh, humorous documents sort of poking fun at science and geology in general, uh, such as the use of uh, uh, math to confuse people. Uh, but uh, Van Serg was uh, another crater that we thought might be a, a volcanic crater. Uh, when we got there, indeed, it turned out to be a, a impact crater. After some sampling and work at the rim of Van Serg, uh, I then, uh, going back to the lunar uh, rover, uh, made very, very good progress with a, uh, this cross-country skiing technique. Uh, I was probably moving about 10 kilometers an hour through this boulder field, so it, uh, it really shows that human beings are going to be very, very adaptable very quickly to working in strange gravitational environments. The Apollo Lunar Roving Vehicle, or LRV, was a very, very effective field vehicle for us. It weighed about 450 Earth pounds. You could drive it about 12 kilometers an hour. That uh, speed was sufficient. It seemed a lot faster than it sounds, because every time you hit a bump in one six gravity, you'll bounce off the surface for a while. Uh, we uh, took it up to 18 kilometers an hour down a, uh, a ridge and uh, decided that was probably a little bit too fast. But it has been realized for a long time that if you have a pressurized rover uh, that allows you to use consumables that you carry on the rover, uh, you not only can increase your distance away from the lunar module, but you can uh, think about going uh, several days. Recently, that concept has taken form in a uh, pressurized rover that is large enough to normally uh, have two astronauts uh, working within it. Uh, in an emergency, it could take up to four astronauts and would allow those astronauts to make critical judgments on where they were going to work uh, before even getting into their suits and getting out onto the lunar surface. All in all, it looks as if the uh, ability to have a pressurized rover on the moon will add significantly to the return of exploration missions. By far the most important thing that Apollo did was that it demonstrated that human beings can now live in the solar system. They can explore and establish themselves as creatures of the moon and of Mars and, uh, and who knows where else in this beautiful solar system of ours.